Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks for the opportunity to worship you, to listen for your word. I ask this morning that either because of me or in spite of me, you bring a message to your people. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, like Zoe, I was going to ask for John Stressball as well. Um, at times, there's, there's moments in preparing for sermons where everything just comes together, it works very well, and everything's nice and neat. And then there's other times that God comes in and begins revisiting and uh, rewriting and revisioning what, what you are to share. And this is one of those mornings. So um, I'm, I'm praying for God's words to come through. And I certainly uh, believe and hope that they will uh, this morning. But bear with me as we go through this. We're in our sermon series on the Valley of Shadows. And today is our sixth sermon. And we'll be focusing on the shadow of death. Um, heavy topic, which elicits feelings of, uh, for some, of sorrow, of hurt, of fear, and even more of mystery, of wondering what it's all about. To examine this, we're going to take a look at the con- concepts of life and death and look closely at the example of Christ for how to speak life into death. Often when we think of life, we imagine the physical definition that accompanies it. Breathing, heartbeat, all those things. The same is true when we consider death. We define it as the absence of life. Not breathing, no heartbeat, nothing there. However, when we peel back the layers of each, we see that there is much more to our understanding of both of them. Jesus said that he came that we might have life and have it to the full. In other words, an abundant life. So that gives us an understanding that there's a difference between just living and really living, a difference between life and that abundant life that Jesus offers. Uh, In the study book that we're using for Lent, Shadows, Darkness, and Dawn, the author offers a look at happy versus unhappy marriages. He shares that in unhappy marriages, uh, the one spouse will look across the table at their spouse and they see only what the other person is not. Not wealthy enough, not pretty enough, not domestic enough, not all sorts of things, but when they look at that person, they only see what that person is not. Whereas in the happy marriage, uh, the one looks across the table at their spouse and sees the abiding blessing that they have in them. Instead of seeing the faults, they see the blessing, they see the hope, uh, they see the, the wonderful person that is there and the blessing that they offer to them. If we examine the way we each approach and appreciate life in the same way as this, we will have a good sense of whether we are truly living or just going through the motions of it. When we examine our life, are we overly aware of the problems that exist within it, or are we more aware of the abiding blessings that we have in our life? When we examine our faith, are we fixated more on the doubts that we have or the unexplainable blessedness we have from God? When we think of the church, do we focus on all the things we find wrong with it? or get excited about the blessing of opportunity to serve God and fellowship with our fellow believers. Those that can see the blessings over the problems I contend are living the abundant life promised by Christ. It is when we don't see the blessings that the question of our truly living needs to be examined. In our gospel lesson today, Um, about the death and resuscitation of Lazarus, we see a stark difference in the way God understands life and death versus our human understanding. Jesus had the warning that Lazarus was sick. Mary and Martha called out to him to come and to to be there for Lazarus. The, The one you love is ill. And he knew this and he was with his disciples, but he chose not to come. And then we listen to his language when he's talking to his disciples about going to see him finally. And he says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. 
And what do the disciples think? He's only asleep? Well, sleep is good, right? When we're sick, we should sleep because that makes us healthier, correct? But they were misunderstanding what Jesus was saying, and he had to, re he had to go and revisit it and saying, um, uh, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. Let us go to him. And he went there, and he met with Martha, and he met with Mary, and he met with the other people that were there, and he gathered with his disciples as well, and he spoke life to Lazarus. He actually brought Lazarus out of the tomb. We have resuscitation of Lazarus after being dead for four days, but he was also speaking something more. Jesus saw that death was not the end. Jesus saw that death was not a finality. For him, it was as it were sleep, uh, being woken up from that sleep. So in that process, Jesus was speaking life, not just to Lazarus, but also speaking life into the understanding of death that the people had there at the time, Martha, Mary, even the disciples. See, for God, death is not the ending. Death is no different from sleeping. Jesus' plan was to wake him up, to speak life into his death. And the perception of death that Mary and Martha had and the disciples had. So, in essence, speaking life into this whole concept. Speak Life has become an important part of our Amped Youth Ministry and some of the uh, conversation that we've been having there. We launched a campaign called the Speak Life Campaign. We actually joined with it. It was something that came through a song by an artist named Toby Mack. Um, and the whole concept of this is the power that we have of our tongue. Uh, and this came out of our conversation around bullying and things like that that take place in the schools. With our tongue, we have the ability to lift people up or the ability to tear people down. There's great power in that, in what we say to others. The concept behind the Speak Life campaign was the recognition that we can also use our tongue and the things that we say to speak life into situations that people are going through. So you may have noticed in your bulletin today a sticky note. Part of the Speak Life campaign from the youth is they decided to write special messages in, uh, on sticky notes and put them in some of the bulletins. And I received one that says, you are a blessing. And that is a great way of lifting up and speaking life into people's lives. And that's just one of the ways. So be on the lookout. There may be other ways that youth may be finding opportunities to speak life to you. In the midst of the campaign, I've encouraged them to find ways of looking in the mirror and speaking life to themselves, recognizing that they are children of God, created uh, in God's image, and that God loves them, and there's abundant grace there. But I've also encouraged them to find ways of speaking life to other people, people in their family, people in their schools, people that they don't even know. Over the course of this week, uh, even the leaders have had opportunities to find ways of speaking life. For me this week, uh, probably the most profound uh, experience I had was a phone call uh, that I received at the church. And we often have people call in that just need to talk to someone. And I won't mention his name, but a gentleman called uh, just needing to talk. And he was convinced that because of his past sins uh, and all the things that he had done wrong and the fact that he hadn't listened to God and he hadn't followed God, that God had cursed him with a terrible illness that not even the doctors could uh, diagnose and that he was going to die. Uh, and deeply convinced of this. And not only was he going to die, but God was killing him in retribution for all the things that he had ever, ever done wrong. Uh, our first conversation was about two hours long of talking and sharing God's grace. In the midst of the conversation, I discovered that um, Google had become his source for understanding God. And as you know, Google requires you to enter search words in, correct? So the search words he was putting in were judgment. Um, 
God's uh, retribution and punishment and things like that. And of course, what was getting spit out to him were verses in scripture that talk specifically about God punishing and God judging and God destroying. But any of us who really take a look at scripture and take a look at what God has to say recognize the, the, that there is abundant grace for each of us, that there is incredible forgiveness that is offered to us. Even in our scripture lessons for today, we see God speaking life uh, through Jesus Christ in the, in the midst of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. We see God speaking life in the scripture of Psalm 23, which we'll talk about in a moment. And having the opportunity to share this with him over and over again and helping him to see that life is not over, that he still has breath, that God is still with him and that there is opportunity for, for forgiveness and that even his illness may not be exactly what he thinks it is. It was a tremendous opportunity to try and help speak life into the midst of someone that felt deep in despair in the shadow of death. We, like this gentleman I spoke with this week, are living in that shadow of death. Death is a natural part of life. The question is, do we live in its shadow, allowing fear to rob us of an abundant life? The answer is no. And the hope for us is found in our psalm for today, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow. In some translations, it's pursue. Pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. These are incredible words of hope. These are incredible words that speak life into our concept of death at times, into our concept of of. Uh, of absence, um, and we need to hear it this way. If we take a look at Psalm 23, it comes on the heels of Psalm 22, which is a psalm of lament in which we hear the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those times in which uh, we feel as though we are completely absent from God or God is completely absent from us. For the gentleman I talked with this week, that's definitely where he was. He felt like not only had God abandoned him, but God had judged him and condemned him to death. And typically in a lament, it ends with a lifting up. It ends with a word of grace. But instead of ending there, it was Psalm 23 that brings this about that shares God's grace, that shares that God is always with us, that shares that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. These are words of hope. These are words of life. Psalm 23 speaks life into that lament, and it speaks life into each of us when we consider that. In Christ, we have our good shepherd that is spoken of in Psalm 23. The one who spoke life into Lazarus and the one who speaks life into each and every one of us. So the question becomes, are we truly alive? More than just in the physical definition. If we have accepted the words of life that Christ has spoken into all of creation, then we are truly alive. As people alive in Christ, we are the light of the world to help speak life into the shadow of death that entraps those in bondage to fear, to frustration, to injustice, to poverty, to sin and despair. These are opportunities, areas of opportunity where we have as Christian people with a gospel message, the opportunity to speak life into those situations for people. Those are, who are in fear of death or other things, those are, who are frustrated with their life or other situations going on, those who are suffering from injustice, those suffering from poverty, those that feel that they are deep in sin and those that are in despair, opportunities to speak life into the shadow of death that they are feeling. 
I encourage each and every one of us to take some time as we approach the cross of Good Friday and Easter morning to examine our life in Christ. And through his example and the power of the Holy Spirit, look for opportunities to speak life to others. Let the light from Christ through you dispel the shadows over others. Amen. Amen. And now